we talk about the history of women in music, it's impossible not to notice the obvious lack of body diversity among the key players. It remains shocking that the majority of famous women throughout entertainment had the average appearance of what society dictates to be a typically beautiful person. But there is one figure who stands out among the rest as having broken the barriers and proven that even women who didn't have a typical body type, even women who were over the average weight, could be in love with music, could have a bright, bold personality, could be the most talented and the most enigmatic person in the room. If you guys are digging my content so far, do me a favor and like this video and subscribe to my channel. Let's talk legends. Cass Elliot was born Ellen Naomi Cohen. Her parents were both children of Russian Jewish immigrants who struggled financially and traveled around a lot as a result. Although her parents were simple people who worked in the restaurant business and in nursing, they both loved music, particularly opera music, which her father adored. Her mother was also a pianist and there was just always music playing in their house, often jazz artists like Ella Fitzgerald. It was in high school that Ellen became Cass. The reason has been debated, but it either has to do with a pet name given to her by her father when he shortened the name Cassandra, the name of a Greek prophetess. Or it was an homage to one of her favorite singers, Peggy Cass. Cass dropped out of high school just before graduating, later moving to New York City, where she changed her last name to Elliot as a tribute to a friend who had passed away in a car accident. Cass hadn't started singing yet at this point, but she could sometimes be caught belting out the classics in a coat check room at the clubs in Manhattan, where she worked when she first arrived. It was 1962, Cass was working in theater, bumping into contemporaries like Barbara Streisand, who she even lost a role to once. New York's folk scene was heating up and Cass was just getting into singing. She met folk singer Tim Rose, who was playing in a band at the time, and took her down to Greenwich Village, where the folk scene was really thriving. He asked her to join his band, and not long after, the two replaced their third singer with folk singer James Hendrix, and renamed themselves The Big Three. 1963 in the United States is a time that I consider the simmer before the boil. President Kennedy would be killed before the end of the year, but before then the civil rights movement would make great progress, and the war in Vietnam Vietnam was starting to really heat up, not to mention ongoing tension in the Cold War. Prior to 1965, when President Johnson put a stop to it, men who were married could be exempt from the draft for the sake of their wives and potential families. This of course was an era when women were almost entirely dependent on their husbands for income, a time when society supported the patriarchy in all measures. But once the war in Vietnam started to require more foot soldiers, and they realized that many young men were rushing off to get married for the sole purpose of avoiding the draft, they changed the law making it so that married men without children could still be drafted. One of the men who took advantage of this rule before the change took place was James Hendrix, who arranged with Cass to be married in 1963. They were just good friends and bandmates though, and they would never actually consummate the marriage. This situation lasted all the way until 1968 when they finally got an annulment. Before then though, in 1964, Cass and Hendrix broke from the big three and started their own group, the Mugwumps, which saw the departure of Tim Rose and the introduction of three new members into the group, John Sebastian, Zal Yanovsky, and Denny Doherty. Though this group was short-lived and they would part ways before the end of their first year, it was an important stepping stone for two of the biggest groups of the 1960s, The Love and Spoonful, formed by John and Zal, and The Mamas and the Papas. Denny Doherty was a Canadian singer from Halifax. He'd been touring in a group with Zal Yanovsky, called the Halifax Three, when he met and became friends with Cass, who was still in the Big Three at the time. On the same tour, he became acquainted with John and Michelle Phillips. Not long afterwards, the Halifax Three called it quits, and Denny and Zal moved to the States to join the Mugwumps. When all of this fell apart in just eight months, Denny found himself without a job, and Cass decided to try it out as a solo act. But the two remained very close and always kept in touch. Denny decided to audition for a new band that John Phillips was starting with his wife Michelle. They loved his style and his look, and they asked him to join the band immediately. But it didn't take long for them to ask him who this mysterious person was that he was always talking on the phone with. She's my best friend, he said of Cass. And when he told them that she could sing, they were even more interested. Denny and Cass's relationship was unclear and undefined. Cass fell in love with Denny the first time she laid eyes on him, and would remain so for the duration of their career together. Denny, on the other hand, adored Cass, but he didn't see her in any kind of romantic way, something that before he died he admitted that he lived with a lot of regret about, and this unrequited love would come back to haunt the band later. So it was the mid-1960s, and Denny had invited Cass over to the Phillips apartment to finally meet them. Before she arrived, the three of them thought it would be a great idea to try this new drug that everybody 
everybody was talking about LSD. So Michelle takes a hit in like a cliche drug movie from the 90s. She starts to complain that she can't feel it working. Suddenly there's a knock on the door and Michelle hops up to answer it. The LSD took effect right around this moment. And there was Cass in a bright pink sweater, a white pleated miniskirt, and go-go boots. Cass really wanted to be in their group. Denny thought that she was great. She and Michelle hit it off right away. John though, a person that I hesitate even to mention, was basically a controlling conceited jerk who claimed that Cass just couldn't hit those high notes that he needed her to for his compositions. This of course was a bunch of crap because Cass had a nearly perfect voice. And the likely truth is that John didn't want a fat woman in his band. He even alluded to this idea by stating that she didn't have the right look when standing next to the three of them. The group decided around this time to take a trip somewhere together to work everything out. They spun a globe and Michelle put her finger down on the Virgin Islands and so off they went without Cass, who wasn't initially invited but who Denny would call up to join them later. It was during this trip to the Virgin Islands that Denny and Michelle started flirting just a little bit too much. Cass was getting angry. She was still very in love with Denny but here was Michelle and Cass loved Michelle. It's not like they weren't friends. This tension in the group started right at the beginning and it would plague them throughout the rest of their career. The story that John later told was that Cass hit her head on a lead pipe and the next morning woke up being able to hit the notes that he wanted her to. This being the only reason that she wasn't allowed in the band, he of course had to let her in. Cass likely went along with the story because it was less embarrassing for her than admitting that the reason that he probably didn't want her in the band was because of her weight. Cass spent almost her entire life being self-conscious about her weight. As a new band, the new journeymen thought that they should maybe change their name, having two women in their band now. Cass had heard that the Hell's Angels called their women mamas and so they came up with the mamas and the papas and Cass was christened with the name that she would never be able to shake for the rest of her life that she had even known by primarily 50 years later. Mama Cass. When the band ran out of money in the Virgin Islands they needed to fly home. Once they were back in the States it wasn't long before Cass's friend and fellow musician Barry McGuire got them a meeting with Lou Adler of Dunhill Records in Los Angeles. Lou wanted Cass. He could see that she had both the talent and the charm to make it in the music industry and he had the foresight to see that in 1966 her unusual shape might actually be a benefit to them. But Cass was still angry. This growing flirtation between Denny and Michelle was infuriating and she was still pissed that John was so hesitant for her to join. So they put it to a vote. Lou Adler, Michelle Phillips, and Denny Doherty all voted for Cass to be in the band against John and so it was. In the Mamas and the Papas Cass quickly became the most recognizable and most beloved member of the group but she was always seemingly the butt of the joke in the mamas and the papas. No one's getting fat except Mama Cass, they sang joyously. And all the while, Cass is becoming the most popular person in Los Angeles. While the mamas and papas were getting started, Cass lived in the basement of the Laurel Canyon County store, the place where she lived when John wrote 1230, including the iconic line, young girls are coming to the canyon. It wasn't long though before she was making the kind of bank that afforded her the opportunity to buy a house in the canyon, home of Hollywood actress Natalie Wood. As soon as Cass moved in, she turned the house into a party house and a meeting place for all the developing artists of the Laurel Canyon community. Joni Mitchell lived nearby and famously Cass thought to introduce her boyfriend, former member of the British group The Hollies, Graham Nash, to David Crosby and Stephen Sills because she thought their voices might work well together. She was considered a kind of matriarch to the community, Graham even referring to her as the Gertrude Stein of Laurel Canyon for the similarities in the way that her home was like a gathering place for the most influential people of the era. But Cass wanted to be a mother. She told all the people she knew that she wanted a baby because of all of the love that she had to give. Little is known about the circumstances of her conception, but in the summer of 1966, Cass became pregnant with her daughter Owen Vanessa, who was born the following year. Cass kept her pregnancy almost entirely a secret, something she was only able to pull off because of her shape. And even after Owen was born, she refused to divulge who the father was. It wasn't until years later that Owen discovered that her father was country singer Charlie Day. By 1968, Cass was quickly outgrowing the mamas and the papas. She recorded a cover of the classic jazz song Dream a Little Dream of Me and on the record insisted that the credit read Mama Cass with the mamas and papas which infuriated John, who was more than likely pissed that the fat girl he didn't want in his band was now outshining him by a long shot. Cass was a star. 
and the success of Dream a Little Dream of Me confirmed that she no longer needed any aggravation from him. By the end of 1968, each of them were producing solo albums, and in early 1969, the Mamas and the Papas were history. In the fall of 68, following the release of her first solo album, Cass was booked for a three-week residency at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas for six months before the first performance. She went on a serious crash diet, losing almost a third of her weight, worsening her already existing ulcers and causing a plethora of health issues. Three weeks before she was set to begin, she developed a serious throat infection that affected her voice. She was confined to bed and doing everything to get it together. Unfortunately, on opening night, a celebrity spotted crowd piling in. Cass was dealing with a fever and was seriously too unwell to perform, but she insisted the show must go on. It was a complete disaster. Cass could barely sing. She was clearly very weathered and not herself. The rest of the show was canceled and Cass was rushed to the hospital for an emergency tonsillectomy. It was also during this time that Cass's drug use started to snowball. She was consuming a lot of pills and started to get into heavier substances like cocaine and heroin. This lifestyle, along with her crash dieting, was what would ultimately bring her health down. It's not like she wasn't busy. Cass was on all kinds of television shows, including her own variety show, The Mama Cass Television Program. For a couple of years, she spent almost all her time trying to get away from the Mama Cass moniker and from her previous rock and roll hippie girl persona. She became more of a stage and theater singer, her first real love. She had another shot at her own TV show in 1973 with Don't Call Me Mama Anymore, which was also the name of one of her hit singles. In the summer of 1974, Cass Elliott's career was better than ever. Her solo career was just getting her off the ground. She had just completed a series of sold out shows at the London Palladium and was renting a flat in the city owned by her friend and fellow singer, Harry Nielsen. One night in late July, Cass went to bed and she passed away from a heart attack at the age of 32. Later autopsies would determine that the heart attack was caused by many years of serious crash dieting and binge eating, combined with a culture of heavy substance abuse. And as we know, the story doesn't end there. Cass had been sharing the apartment with her road manager, George Caldwell, and he was the one who discovered her the next morning. Being 1974, they had just recently lost some serious rock stars like Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin, and he immediately assumed it had been an overdose that killed Cass. To avoid the press spreading this inevitable rumor about her, he panicked, and when they asked how she died, he said she choked while eating a sandwich. The news of this spread like crazy, a complete insult to Cass, and a humiliating way to spread the news about the passing of such a great woman. Fat phobia is something that is still extremely prevalent in our society today, but in the 1960s and early 70s, it was devastatingly common and accepted in the mainstream. Even Cass's close friends made fun of her weight to her face, but she pushed through it and she did persevere. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. If you enjoyed my content, you can like the video and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.